Commonwealth County and the state of Florida is now in session. The Honorable Russell L. Healy is presiding. Please turn off all cell phones and electronic devices at this time. The use of cell phones, cell phone cameras, photographic, recording, or electronic devices of any kind is absolutely prohibited and they must be turned off while court is in session. Credential representatives of the media who have gained approval from the court may use laptops, iPads, and tablets provided. However, they must not be used for photographic and or recorded purposes. There will be no talking while court is in session. For justice to be served, the jury must be able to stay focused on the court proceeding. Therefore, talking or disruptive behavior by anyone in the audience will not be tolerated. A violation of any of these rules will result in you being removed from the courtroom. You may be seated. Good morning, or good afternoon, actually. And good afternoon to everybody that's here. Um, <clears throat> We are ready to begin, uh, I believe. Is uh, the state ready to proceed? The state of Florida is ready, Your Honor. Ms. Hannity, the defense? Yes, Your Honor. And if we can have Mr. Dunn brought out, that would help. Um, <clears throat> So again, Ms. Hannity, are you ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Um, as anybody can see, uh, I would at this time renew all of our previously filed motions and objections. Uh, I would also, uh, based on the grounds that we'd previously argued, um, including everything up to and through the jury selection process. All right. Um, I will note that... Uh, there was some conversation yesterday, I guess, about the selection of the jury and uh, that related to the motion to change venue, which um, I'll enter an order later today, denying. <clears throat> and while the juror questionnaires would reflect it, uh, for the record, out of the 16 jurors, while uh, many of them knew of the case, none of them had formed an opinion except for one who indicated that he could set aside whatever opinion he'd formed. And in actuality, there was no objection to the seating of that particular juror. Um, so uh, we will bring the jurors in in just a second and proceed. Ms. Hannity, do you want me in the preliminary instructions to read the portion about uh, the defendant not having to testify, present, or prove anything? I would, Your Honor. We would also at this time invoke the rule of sequestration. All right, I believe we had discussed that before and it had maybe previously been put on the record, but um, the rule is invoked and so both sides are instructed to inform their witnesses uh, that it is in effect and that they are not to discuss their testimony with other witnesses and really not discuss their testimony with anyone other than the attorneys uh, in the case. Uh, state agreeable and understand that? Yeah, we've done it orally and in writing already for all witnesses. Okay. Um, all right, then, let's bring the jurors on in. Jurors that are in the courtroom. <clears throat> Good morning, or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. Uh, I trust everything went smoothly last night and this morning, and that everybody's settled in at the hotel, and hopefully the accommodations are, are to your uh, approval. Um, was everything all right? Well, one of the lieutenants indicated that you were all going to probably say uh, that he indicated that everything was fine or something like that. So uh, I guess he spent time this morning trying to, to get you all to say that in unison, but 
Good, you're an independent thinker, so that's a good thing. Uh, before you sit, I need you all to raise your right hand. The clerk is going to administer the oath to you as the actual jury to try this case. Do each of you solemnly swear or affirm that you will well and truly try the issues between the state of Florida and the defendant, Michael David Dunn, and render a true verdict according to the law and the evidence so help you God? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You can have a seat. And again, good afternoon. Um, we spent Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday working on selecting you folks as the jury to try the case of the state of Florida versus Michael David Dunn, and now you have actually been sworn to be that jury. As you know, this is a criminal case, and the defendant is charged with the offense of murder in the first degree. The elements of that offense uh, will be explained to you at the close of the trial when I give you the jury instructions. You should know that your solemn responsibility is to determine if the state has proven its accusations beyond a reasonable doubt against the defendant, Michael Dunn. Your verdict must be based solely on the evidence or lack of evidence and on the law that I will instruct you on at the close of the case. The in, in information or indictment that has been brought in this case, as I told you on several occasions, is not evidence and it is not to be considered by you as any proof of a defendant's guilt. It's my responsibility to decide what laws apply to this case and to explain those laws to you. It is your responsibility to decide what the facts of the case may be and to apply the law that I instruct you on to those facts in order for you to reach a lawful verdict. Thus, the province of the court and the province of the jury are well defined and they do not over, uh, overlap. This is one of the fundamental principles of our justice system. Before we actually begin, I'll give you a quick overview of how the trial is conducted. Uh, basically, in just a few moments, you will be able to hear from the attorneys. Uh, they'll have an opportunity to give you opening statements or opening remarks. The opening statements gives them a chance to tell you what they believe you will see and hear during the course of the trial. You should know, though, that what the attorneys say is not evidence either. Evidence is only going to come before you in the form of testimony from the witness stand, uh, exhibits, photographs, documents, things of that nature that we've discussed during jury selection. But you should give careful and close attention to the opening statements because, again, the attorneys are trying to uh, give you an overview of what they believe will come before you during the course of the trial over these next several days. After the attorneys have given you their opening remarks, witnesses will be called to the stand. They will be examined and cross-examined under oath. And as I said, other exhibits or things of that nature may be offered into evidence, and you'll have an opportunity to see those uh, basically uh, on your monitors there that are in front of you in the jury box. You'll also have an opportunity to take those things back with you into the jury room once you go to deliberate a verdict. After the evidence has been presented, the attorneys will then have an opportunity to make closing arguments or remarks to you. And when they have finished with that, I will then read the jury instructions to you that apply to this particular case. And then after that, you'll be allowed to go into the jury room to deliberate your verdict. Until that time, you should not form any definite or fixed opinion about the merits of the case, uh, and you should not do that until you've heard all of the evidence, the arguments of the attorneys, and the instructions on the law that I will give you. During the course of the trial, as you know, we'll take recesses and breaks. You'll be allowed to go about uh, somewhat to some extent your business. Uh, during those times, uh, you should not try and obviously uh, investigate the case. You should not communicate with anyone. You should not discuss the case among yourselves or with others. You should not allow anyone to discuss the case in your presence. If that were to happen, again, you would inform those folks that you are a juror on this case and that they should stop it. If it continued, you should uh, leave them at once and just report it to one of the bailiffs. Uh, because you're being sequestered, that probably is not going to happen. But if it were to, then you know uh, how to handle the situation. And as we discussed on several occasions, the reason for that is that the case must be tried uh, in this courtroom, in your presence, the presence of the attorneys, the defendant, and myself. No juror should conduct any investigation on their own. And as we've talked about, this includes reading newspapers, watching televisions, uh, using computers, cell phones, internets, things of that nature. Um, you should also know that in every criminal proceeding, a defendant has the absolute right to remain silent. At no time is it the duty of a defendant to prove his innocence. 
From the exercise of a defendant's right to remain silent, a jury is not permitted to draw any inference of guilt, and the fact that if, that a defendant did not take the witness stand must not influence your verdict in any manner whatsoever. You should also know, know that the attorneys are trained in the rules of evidence and procedure. It's their duty to make any and all objections that they feel are necessary and proper during the course of the trial. When an objection is made, you should not speculate on the reason why it is made. And when an objection is sustained or upheld by me, you should not speculate on what the answer to the question would have been had I allowed the witness to actually answer that question. You will also be allowed to take notes during the course of the trial. You should have, and you do, paper and pen there um, for your use. And um, so you'll have that. During the course of the trial, when we take breaks, we will watch over your notes so that nobody will be able to see them or look at them. Uh, the same thing will happen in the evening when we take our breaks. Regarding the notes, though, let me um, caution you a little bit about note taking. Some people are probably better note takers than others. Uh, during the course of the trial, you may all observe that one of you might be a better note taker than the whole rest of the group. Uh, and then at the end of the case, you might say, well, why don't we just rely on this particular person's notes? They look like they're really, really good notes. That cannot be done. The notes are for your own individual use and to help you recall uh, your recollection and impressions of the testimony and evidence that came before you. So you're not to share your notes with anyone else and they're only for your actual use. While you're taking your notes, uh, basically this is the witness chair over here. Witnesses will be there. The attorneys will be kind of back towards the end of the uh, jury box there. There'll be a podium and that's generally where they'll be asking some questions. Sometimes they like to move around but not too much. When the questions are being asked and the answers are being given, uh, and you may be taking notes, the attorneys, after a question and an answer, don't wait to look and see if everybody has finished writing down notes. They're going to keep going. There's a flow to this. So I just caution you about that because you want to be able to be, it, con be continuing to pay close attention to what's coming next. What comes next may be not that particularly important, but it might be more important than the things that, or just as important as the things that you're writing down. So kind of keep that in mind uh, when you're taking your notes. Uh, with that said, though, uh, we are ready to begin, and we will hear from the uh, state first. And on behalf of the state, we'll hear from Mr. Guy. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, sir. May it please the court? <clears throat> yes, sir. Counsel, good afternoon. For all of his loud music and his four-letter words, and his teenage bravado, in the end, when it came right down to it, Jordan Russell Davis was just that, a kid. 17, not yet halfway through his junior year of high school. And so when he saw a semi-automatic pistol pointed at him, he did the best he could to save his own life. He shut his mouth and he cowered away from the gun. Too late. Not good enough. Insufficient. Because the grown man holding that gun, Michael David Dunn, 47, had had enough of the mouthy, audacious, disrespectful teenager in the car next to him. And so with malice in his heart and intent in his aim, he took a semi-automatic pistol, pointed it out his window, and fired three times. All three shots hit their intended target. One bullet hit Jordan Davis in his right side, passed through his liver, passed through both his lungs, passed through his aorta. Another bullet hit the back of his right leg through his groin area. Another bullet passed through the back of his left leg. And then the driver of the car that Jordan Davis was sitting in, in a panic, backed up as fast as he could. Too late. Not good enough. Insufficient. Michael Dunn was not finished. Even though 
Jordan Davis had been silenced forever. So he paused and he continued his aim and pulled the trigger four more times. Three of those shots hit the side of the car that Jordan Davis and three other teenagers were in. And then the driver of the car sped away, forward as fast as he could, trying to separate himself from the gunfire. Too late. Not good enough. Insufficient. Michael Dunn got out of his car, took a shooter's stance on one knee, re-aimed his gun, and pulled the trigger three more times. All three shots hit the back of the car that Jordan Davis and those three other boys were riding in. And then, as Jordan Davis lay slumped over in the arms of his 17-year-old best friend, Leland Brunson, with blood and life seeping out of his body, the defendant got back in his car with his girlfriend and just drove off into a Jacksonville night. He went back to his hotel, poured a tall rum and coke, took his little dog for a walk, ordered a pizza, watched some TV, and went to sleep. But in the morning, when he found out that the boy in the car next to him was dead, he packed his bags, he checked out of his hotel, and he drove home to Satellite Beach, Florida, some two and a half hours away, as though nothing Nothing had happened. But ladies and gentlemen, as you're about to learn, there are some things that Michael Dunn will never, ever be able to just drive away from. Physical evidence in the form of bullet trajectories that will prove two things to you beyond any doubt. That when Jordan Davis was shot and murdered, he was leaning to his left, away from the defendant who was on his right. And Jordan Davis had nothing in his hands. The words from the defendant's own mouth at the time of the killing, words of hate, words of intent that he can't now take back. And finally, memories indelible memories of all those people who were at that gas station, who watched this, and the memories of the three boys who lived inside the car. <coughs> if you'll indulge me for the next few minutes, I would like to share with you in a little greater detail the end of Jordan Davis's young life and the overwhelming evidence of this defendant's guilt. The date was November 23rd, 2012, Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. And as teenagers are wont to do, 17-year-old Jordan Davis called his best friend Leland Brunson and another 17-year-old named Tevin Thompson and a 19-year-old named Tommy Storms who had a car to go to the mall, to girl shop, so they went to the town center, and they struck out. The only person of note that they saw was Jordan Davis's on-again, off-again girlfriend, Aaliyah Harris, who worked at a store there, uh, Urban Outfitters. So the four boys got back into the Dodge Durango that Tommy Storms had and headed for another mall on the south side, the Avenues Mall, to continue girl shopping. But they stopped. They stopped at the gate gas station at Southside Bay Meadows. So Tommy Storms could go inside and get some gum and some cigarettes. And while he did, the three boys, Leland Brunson, Tevin Thompson, and Jordan Davis, sat in the Durango listening to music, rap music, loud rap music. And then into their lives and into the space directly on the passenger side of the car, 
told this defendant, who was with his girlfriend, Rhonda Roward. They had just come from the defendant's son's wedding in Orange Park, Florida, and they were on their way back to their hotel. And when they pulled in, the music was playing. And the defendant looked at his girlfriend and said, I hate that thug music. And Rhonda Rauer just looked at him and said, I know, and then went inside. And rather than go into the store or move to another space or just ignore it, the defendant rolled down his window and said to Tevin Thompson, who was seated in the front passenger seat across from him, hey, can you turn that down? I can't hear myself think. And Tevin Thompson turned it down. But Jordan Davis, who was sitting behind Tevin Thompson in the rear passenger seat, didn't want to be told what to listen to or at what volume to listen to it at. So he told Tevin Thompson, F him, turn it back up. And he didn't say F, he used, he used a curse word. He didn't say him, he used a derogatory word. And Tevin Thompson turned the music back up. And then Jordan Davis and the defendant started exchanging words, curse words. Jordan Davis was upset, and he was letting the defendant know it. He was disrespecting him, no doubt. And then as Tommy Storms came back to the car and got in the driver's seat, the defendant said to Jordan Davis, are you talking to me? And Jordan Davis said, yeah, I'm talking to you. And the defense said, you're not going to talk to me that way. And he reached over in his glove box, and he pulled out his Taurus 9mm pistol. And he pulled a slide back, and he stuck it out his window. And from a distance, much closer than you and I, fired those first three shots. And then the car started backing up, and the defendant paused and fired four more times. Three of those bullets hit the side of the car. The fourth one missed. And then Tommy Storn started pulling forward into an adjacent parking lot to get away from the gunfire. It didn't stop. The defendant got out of his car, got in that shooter stance, and pulled the trigger three more times. Two of those bullets went in the back taillight of the Durango. One of those bullets passed through the passenger cabin of the Durango between the heads of all four boys. It lodged in the visor above Tommy Storm's head, the driver. And then the defendant got in his car and left in his black Jetta and just drove out on Southside Boulevard. But Tommy Storms stopped right in the parking lot after going maybe 300 feet, maybe. And he and the other boys started calling their, each other's names. And everybody responded to their name, except Jordan Davis. So they got out of the car, Tevin Thompson, in the front passenger seat, and Tommy Storms. And they opened the back doors. <laughs> and they saw Jordan Davis lying over in Leland Brunson's lap. He wasn't moving. He wasn't talking. He wasn't responding. He was gasping for air. And so they jumped back in the car and back straight up to the light and the safety and the help of where they had come from, the gate station. And when they got there, there was help and there was light. Civilians pulled Jordan Davis out of the car and tried in vain to push life back into his body. The evidence in this case is going to take you back to that night at 7.38 PM. And you will hear from the people who were there, people like Stephen Smith, <clears throat> a contractor who would stop at the gate for a fountain drink, and who, when he came out the front door from the very first car to his right, heard somebody say, 
You're not going to talk to me that way. And he looked over and he saw a grown man with a gun in his hand who had uttered those words. It was that defendant. And then he saw him point the gun at the car right next to him. A car from which he could see no one emerging. No weapons. No words. No nothing. And the defendant pulled the trigger three times. And then four more. And then three more as the car backed out. And then Stephen Smith saw the car pull right back in. With four panicked kids inside. It had been gone for maybe two minutes, two and a half minutes max. You'll hear from people like Andrew Williams, who when he heard the gunshots turned into the gate parking lot because he had some medical background. And he pulled Jordan Davis out of the car and put his hands on a stranger's chest to pump life back into him. And people like Samantha Ikes, who pulled into the parking lot, into the space at the gate, between the time that Tommy Storms had left and come back, and saw the holes in the car and four panicked kids and called 911. People like Sean Atkins, who had the wherewithal to remember the license plate number of the shooter's car, the black Jetta, that would be given to police. People like Christopher and Alyssa LeBlanc, who were having dinner at the Loop restaurant in that small plaza of stores adjacent to the gate parking lot, and who, when they were walking out to their car, heard gunshots and looked to their left and saw the red Dodge Durango speeding towards them and stopped short of them, not in a parking space, right in the middle of the parking lot, and two black men get out, Tommy Storns and Tevin Thompson, and saw them open the back doors and look in. They had no idea what Tevin Thompson and Tommy Storns were looking at, their friend dying. And they'll tell you, neither one of those guys, Tevin Thompson or Tommy Storns, left the area of the car. They didn't take anything out of the car or throw anything out of the car. All they did was open the doors, look in the back, and jump right back in and back straight up. And then the LeBlancs called 911. And you'll also hear, ladies and gentlemen, from the three teenagers in the car. Tommy Storms, the driver. Tall guy, real skinny. High-pitched voice, dreadlocks down to his shoulders. How when he got back into the Durango, he had been in the store. He looked over and saw the defendant pointing a gun at his car, heard the shots and backed up. It sped away, stopped the car, realized Jordan Davis had been hit, and came back and called 911. And Tevin Thompson, big guy, round face, smiles a lot was in the car the whole time. And Leland Brunson, another real skinny guy in the back seat next to Jordan Davis. And they'll tell you that Jordan Davis was upset, that he was barking at the defendant, cussing at him, disrespecting him. But the only thing Jordan Davis ever had in his hands was a cell phone. and that he never threatened to hurt the defendant. He never tried to get out of his car. And you'll learn that the cars were so close together, the doors wouldn't even open all the way, the way the defendant pulled in so close to him. And they'll tell you about what happened inside that car. And you'll learn that Jordan Davis was 5 feet 11, 145 pounds. Wait till you see the pants that he was wearing and how small they are. And the goofy little hat he had on. A little Burton ski hat with a little ball on top. The defendant, 6'4", well over 200 pounds. And ladies and gentlemen, you won't just have the witness testimony. You are going to hear a bone chilling audio tape 
because the gate station has surveillance cameras on the inside of the store, not on the outside, the inside, that also record audio. So you're going to see Tommy Storms in his white t-shirt and his long dreads walking around the store getting gum and cigarettes. And you're going to see the defendant's girlfriend, Rhonda Rauer, put a bottle of wine and a bag of potato chips on the counter. And then all of a sudden, as people are just milling about, three loud bangs. And everybody stops. And then there's a pause. And four more loud bangs. And then there's a longer pause. And the final three shots. And you'll have the Dodge Durango because Tommy Storms came back. And the police got in the car. And they stuck dowel rods through all nine bullet holes. So you'll see exactly the angle that these shots went through the car and through Jordan Davis, three of them. And they searched the car. They found a basketball. They found clothes. They found sneakers. They found drink cups. No weapons. Nothing resembling a weapon. There was a, tr a photo tripod in the car underneath the seat that couldn't be removed without the door opening all the way and somebody sliding it out. Stuff you would find in a 19-year-old's car. And ladies and gentlemen, you won't just have what happened in the Durango. You're going to hear about what was going on in the Jetta, his car. Because Rhonda Rauer is going to testify. And she's going to tell you about what the defendant said about hating thug music. And that she was in the store at the counter when she heard the shots. And like everybody else, looked around and went to the door and opened the door and saw the defendant outside the car. And he yelled at her, get in the car, get in the car. And she did. And he left. Cell phone, right there. Not once did he hit those three digits. He went back to his hotel room, walked past the front counter, put the gun back in his glove box, and went upstairs. Took his little dog, Charlie, for a walk. Poured that rum and coke, one for him, one for Rhonda Rauer ordered a pizza, watched some TV. And Rhonda Rauer will tell you that in the morning, she turned on the news. And there was a story about a shooting on the south side from the night before. And a 17-year-old boy had been murdered. And when she looked at the screen, her heart sank because she saw Tommy Storm's Red Dodge Durango being pulled up on a flatbed truck to be towed away. And she told the defendant, somebody died. His response, I know. Let's go. And they packed their bags and they checked out and drove two and a half hours home with a phone. Those three digits were never pressed. No digits were ever pressed. And you'll learn that as the defendant was sleeping through the night, the sheriff's office was working through the night. Remember Sean Atkins, the guy who wrote down the tag number? It got to the police. They ran the tag number. It came back to him. So they put together photo spreads. After they had interviewed face to face each of those three boys and other witnesses, they put together photo spreads. And they showed it to the three boys independently. Tevin Thompson, who was sitting next to the defendant in the front passenger seat, that's him. That's the guy that shot at us. Michael Dunn's picture. And they showed it 
to Leland Brunson and Tommy Storms, and they both narrowed it down to the defendant and one other picture as best they could. So the police got an arrest warrant in the middle of the night. They alerted the authorities in Brevard County, where the defendant lived, and the defendant was arrested the next morning. And they seized his car in the glove box, the murder weapon. On the floorboard at his feet, one of the 10 shell casings. In that little trough on the outside of the car between the windshield and the engine compartment, four more shell casings that match the five shell casings on the gate station parking lot right next to Jordan Davis's blood and his wallet and a jacket. And you'll hear from a ballistics expert who will tell you about the defendant's gun and how it operates, about how it's not a, tri a hair trigger, how to fire a bullet, you have to pull the trigger one time, and how much pressure it takes. And to fire 10 bullets, a person has to pull the trigger 10 times consciously. And you'll learn, like Miss Corey talked about yesterday, and a lot of y'all smiled when she said it. It's not like TV. This trial's not going to be like TV, I promise you. You know, on the big screen, it happens like they write it on Sunset Boulevard. But in real life, it happens on Southside Boulevard. So Sean Atkins, the guy who got the tag number, since November 23rd, 2012, He's been arrested, prosecuted, sentenced to prison. So when he comes in the courtroom, he'll have on jail clothes, handcuffs. But he'll tell you what he saw and what he heard. Tommy Storms, the driver, 19-year-old Tommy Storms, was on felony probation at the time, had a curfew of 7 p.m. So he was violating curfew when he was out at 7.38 at the gate station. Chris LeBlanc had a capius, which is an arrest warrant for driving on license suspended in between that night and now. <coughs> but all of those people with any baggage all have one thing in common. They were there and they haven't forgotten. And you'll hear finally Stacy Simons with the medical examiner's office who performed the autopsy on Jordan Davis. And she will show you the photographs. She will use a, a lifelike dummy and stick dowel rods in it like they stuck through the car. So you'll see exactly how the bullets entered his body, how the one that went in his right side started here and ended up here because Jordan Davis was leaning over to his left. You'll see an x-ray of the bullet still in his chest. She'll do the same thing with the shots through the backs of his legs, one of which was still lodged in his groin area. She'll tell you he was in the car seat leaned over. She, she, she has been to the car. She has sat where Jordan Davis sat, in addition to doing the autopsy. She'll tell you how he died, why the shot that passed through his chest was fatal. And ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this trial, Judge Healy will read to you the law, the law that applies to all of us and the laws that apply to each of us. And we are confident that after you hear the evidence and all of it, all of it, that you will know in your head and in your heart and in your gut that what happened on that Friday night at the intersection of Southside and Bay Meadows Road was nothing short of murder.
Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir.